Okay, welcome everyone back from lunch, and it's my pleasure to recommence with the keynote, uh, introduce our keynote, uh, Professor Timothy Fry, uh, who has been almost two decades at uh, the Columbia University at the Harriman Center as a professor there, firmly established in our field. Uh, and in that time, he's written uh, at least three books about primarily political economy, about institutions, markets, property, state building, all of the qu big questions of transition that vexed us in that period that seem to vex us less now or in a different way. Um, many of us know uh, Timothy Fry as the editor of Post-Soviet Affairs, where we address him as Professor Fry. <laughs> if uh, you would pr please look at our consideration, take under consideration our manuscript. So we rarely get the chance to have first term uh, first hand and first uh, name uh, interactions with uh, Tim, if I may, 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 may be so bold. Um, but we also um, know the work that um, Tim has done uh, linking up research uh, stateside with research uh, in, in Russia, in uh, the uh, study of it, the, the Center of the Studies of Institutional Development at the Higher School of Economics, which was a very promising uh, development uh, there, amongst many others at the Higher School of Economics that was unfortunately ruptured in 2022. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to have Tim here as our keynote um, and I wanted to also talk about Tim's most recent book, his fourth book, uh, which was of course Weak Strong Man, uh, The Limits of Power in Putin's Russia and a book I would strongly recommend because it brings us to that question of how Putin performs that balancing act on a number of different vectors all at the same time, at, like the world's great uh, juggling act. Um, but in that book, much of the conventional wisdom was questioned, and uh, it's very appropriate now to have the chance uh, for Tim to sort of open up uh, again with changed circumstances. That book came out in 2021, and like all of us, uh, Tim's also wrestling with these uh, great uh, challenges to understand the changing pictures. So without further ado, I'll give you the floor, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, as, as editor of Post-Soviet Affairs, my jokes are much funnier. And I wonder when I, when I step down if people will still laugh. I think they will. So, uh, um, uh, so I'm going to talk today about some uh, public opinion research that I've been doing in Russia uh, with several colleagues. And I, I don't think it's um, a surprise to anybody uh, that it's gotten a lot more difficult to study Russian society. And lots of smart people are trying to figure out how to do that. So we have some groups like Levada Center and Siom doing their traditional face-to-face -face interviewing. We have uh, other groups doing online surveys every day uh, of Russians. We have uh, uh, people from Public Sociology Lab doing uh, deep qualitative uh, uh, interviewing. Uh, and it's really important um, because it's just become very challenging uh, to study a country's public opinion uh, when it's an autocracy uh, and when it's um, at war. And I was really glad this morning that we had a number of different perspectives uh, uh, um, presented here to try to triangulate uh, our understanding of what's going on in Russian society, because that's really important. So let me uh, skip ahead a little bit um, and talk about uh, uh, the, the research that I've done, and then you can decide whether or not you, you, you think, it's, uh, uh, think it's any good. It's uh, joint work with Henry Hale from uh, George Washington University, uh, John Reuter from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and Bryn Rosenfeld from uh, Cornell University. And it's part of the, uh, the Russian election study which is a long-running uh, panel survey of Russian citizens that actually began in 1996. Uh, and after every parliamentary and presidential elections, um, a standard set of questions was asked uh, uh, to respondents. Elections have become less important, um, but the surveys, we hope, uh, are still valuable. And we got very lucky uh, with this survey uh, in the sense that uh, we conducted uh, one wave of the survey, uh, or actually two waves of the survey, 
pretty close to the start of the full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine. Um, so we had a survey in the field in December uh, of, of 2021, and where we asked some questions about people's attitudes uh, towards uh, Ukraine. And what we're, we're able to do with this survey is by asking the, the same people the same questions over time, uh, we're better able to capture uh, uh, trends in their evolution of their uh, uh, responses. So um, uh, uh, this kind of panel approach is really helpful because there's a naughty problem in doing public opinion research. Uh, if you just do a survey at one point in time and you find a correlation between, say, uh, support for Putin and support for the war, it could be that people are supporting Putin because they support the war, or it could be that they support the war because they're supporting Putin. Uh, and it's a very difficult problem uh, uh, to get around. Uh, so what we're able to do in the survey is we're able to use uh, responses that respondents gave us prior to the war, right, in December 2021, to predict their responses uh, in September 2023 when we conducted the most recent wave uh, of the survey. I should say the data that I'll present is mostly from September of 2023, uh, but we have a fourth wave uh, that's going into the field uh, uh, shortly, right? So, uh, uh, Yes, yes, there's always questions about data quality. And um, I'm not sure uh, how many political science geeks there are in the audience like me uh, that are motivated to go into the details about how we figure out whether or not the responses that we're getting are valid uh, and reliable. Um, but let me do... Let me do one thing. You'll allow me, uh, indulge me. I wasn't going to do this, but I, but I can't resist. So, um, for example, one thing, if we look at uh, the Putin approval question, and we look at three waves from uh, uh, August 2021, uh, December 2021, and then September 2023, on the left, if we just ask a binary question, do you, so, do you approve of the political activities of Vladimir Putin? Uh, we see that the, the don't know response was 13 uh, uh, percent of respondents, which is much higher than we saw prior to the war, right? So it could be that people are afraid to reveal their opposition to Vladimir Putin and they hide in the don't know uh, responses. Um, uh, or it could be that during the war, people are just inherently more uncertain about how they feel about Vladimir Putin, given uh, that he has uh, you know, undertaken this full-scale invasion. So in the same survey, we also asked a question, uh, tell us how much you approve of Vladimir Putin on a scale of 0 to 100. So if we use a much finer scale, uh, we find that the don't know responses go way down. And only 3% of respondents said that they don't know or refuse to answer, right? So this suggests that, at least with the Putin approval question, uh, that there is more uncertainty about whether or not respondents approve of Vladimir Putin, and they're not using this answer uh, to hide uh, from uh, uh, I don't know, any kind of reprisals or social, desir social desirability bias um, in that they want to tell the, the interviewer uh, what they want to hear. Um, uh, um, the other, uh, and this is something that Rita mentioned this morning, this list experiment. Um, when I described this uh, the first time to my uh, Russian uh, survey colleagues at, at uh, the Levada Center, they said, at the ocean hitri vapros, which means this is a very cunning question, right? So what we do is we divide uh, our sample into two groups. Uh, one group is a control group, and they get three items, the three items on the left. My father does not have a higher education. I watch uh, television at least once a week, and I've been to Moscow. Uh, then the other randomly selected group uh, in the treatment group gets four items. They get the same three items, but they also get a sensitive item or a potentially sensitive item, which is I support continuing the war in Ukraine. 
And respondents are asked, please don't tell me which of these items uh, 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 apply to you, just tell me how many, right? So the idea here is we want to give the respondents some cloak uh, that they can hide in in order to reveal uh, their true responses because the interviewers can't know which of the items they're actually approving of. Um, we just know how many. So uh, what we see is that when people in the control group were just given those three very bland uh, uh, questions, uh, the average response was about 1.73, right? So people would have said, how many of these uh, uh, do you apply to you? And we find that that answer is 1.73. When we add in the treatment group, um, uh, do you support continuing the war in Ukraine? The average response was 2.1. So even I can do this math, uh, uh, 1.73 uh, minus uh, 2.01 gives us 38%, right? So just by adding this extra item to the question, uh, we find that about 38% of respondents support continuing the war uh, in Ukraine. When we asked people directly, the response was 43%. So a little bit higher, but not significantly higher. So when we use questions like this, we can try to tease out um, whether or not respondents are, are answering these questions honestly. Okay, that's the political science geeky part of the presentation, and we can resume, return to our regularly scheduled scheduled programming, which is the real substance of the matter. Um, although I do think it's, it is important uh, for you to understand that we've done a lot of uh, uh, effort to try to figure out um, whether or not the responses we're getting uh, are accurate. So here's the direct question, which is, uh, do you s support or not support the continuation of special military operation in Ukraine? Uh, so we see that 43% uh, said yes, 34% uh, said no, I do not support, and uh, around 22% said uh, 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 hard to say or I, I refuse to answer. Um, when we divide the sample into respondents who said that they approve of Vladimir Putin, uh, we find that the number goes up uh, to about 54%. So among Putin supporters, about 54% support continuing the war in Ukraine. Uh, but that tells us that uh, you know, roughly 45% uh, um, ha have some reservations about continuing the war, even among uh, Putin supporters. So we think that's a pretty interesting uh, result. Um, this is a, a question I like because it forces respondents to make a trade-off. You know, often when we give respondents questions, they're answering as if it's cost-free. Do you support the war? Yes, I support the war, right? Um, but here we're asking them, okay, um, uh, let's say that, uh, you know, governments have to make hard choices about how they spend their funds. Is it more important for the government to spend on social programs or on the military? Uh, and what we see is, uh, you know, roughly 42% said that they should sp the government should be spending on social policies, and around 30% say uh, military, spond uh, military spending. Um, we also asked some questions about respondents' personal experiences during the war. You know, research from the United States suggests that people's um, uh, experiences during war influence how they um, uh, uh, decide whether or not to support uh, military conflict. Um, uh, here's some of the interesting things is about 14% of our respondents said that some, uh, a close one or a family member had left the country due to the, the special military uh, uh, operation. Uh, and about 40% uh, no, reported that their financial position had noticeably declined. So while the macro economy picture looks great and there are lots of winners in Russia's war economy, there's also lots of people who are very nervous uh, about their, their economic uh, future. Um, now, this is uh, a question that we got lucky with. Uh, in uh, December of 2021, uh, with no foresight that a war was about to break out, we asked respondents, what should Russia do in the situation with Ukraine? Uh, we see about two-thirds of respondents said that uh, Russia should send humanitarian aid or provide moral support. 
about 9% said weapons, and only 8% uh, said uh, send in the armed forces, and 30% said Russia should stay out of it. Um, uh, interestingly, about 8% of respondents said it was hard to say or they refused to answer. And keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to it later in, the, uh, later in the presentation. And I'll show you that those hard to say and refuse to answer responses are associated with less support for continuing the war in the future. Okay? Um, uh, we also asked a question about a, a general mobilization of draft age men. And we find, as others have found, that uh, a, a full-scale mobilization is very unpopular among uh, the Russian public. Our data suggests that about three in four Russians are uh, fully disagree or more or less disagree with uh, conducting a, a general mobilization. Okay? Uh, we get at this in a more subtle way. Uh, with a survey experiment, um, and this is similar to the, the data that, uh, or the, 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 the approach that Rita took earlier this morning. So here, we divide our sample into four groups. The groups are randomly selected, so in principle, they're all identical, and the only difference in the um, uh, responses uh, should be due to the different ways that we ask each of them a question. Right? So we asked this hypothetical question. Um, imagine that tomorrow there will be an election for the State Duma, and in your electoral district, a candidate has been put forward by United Russia. He's 50 years old. His program is focused on increasing support for schools, building new schools in the region. Uh, and during the uh, campaign, some information uh, emerges. It becomes well known that he has adopted two handicapped children from an orphanage. That was because we wanted to give some positive valence to politicians in Russia, uh, as many ordinary citizens are not exactly uh, enthusiastic, as they are in many countries, uh, about their candidates on offer during elections. Okay, uh, so the, the first group, the control agreement, gets no further information, and uh, respondents are asked, how likely are you to vote for this candidate on this four-point scale? Right? A second group um, is uh, uh, told the, the exact same information, uh, but is also told that, in addition, uh, he supports raising the pension age for women to 65. Uh, a third group um, is told uh, that this candidate supports a mobilization of all men of draft age for the special military operation in Ukraine. And a fourth group is told, in addition, he supports beginning peace negotiations with Ukraine. Right? So this is a subtle way to try to get at um, how respondents feel about mobilization, about uh, a policy pension reform, which we know is uh, very unpopular, and about uh, peace negotiations in Ukraine. So what do we find? Um, well, we find that uh, in the group that doesn't receive any further information, where they just get the boilerplate uh, about the, the, the candidate, about 65% of respondents says that they were likely or more or less likely to vote for this candidate. However, when we tell them that this candidate also supported um, raising the uh, uh, pension age, only 23% of respondents said that they were likely or more or less likely to support this candidate. Uh, when we tell them that this candidate also wants to conduct a, uh, a mobilization, uh, only 40% of respondents say that they uh, would be likely to vote for this candidate. And intriguingly, uh, 61% oh, of respondents said that they would be uh, likely to vote for this candidate if they were to begin peace negotiations, right? So what we can take away from this you know, subtle way uh, of uh, asking this question is to that pension reform is really unpopular. Uh, uh, we really knew that. Um, general mobilization is also less unpopular, but somewhat less so. Moreover, there doesn't seem to be an electoral penalty for advocating for peace negotiations, right? There was very little difference between the control group and the group that was told that the candidate was uh, in favor of peace negotiations. So we, we think that these uh, results are um, of kind of, kind of interesting. Um, let me go through one last uh, uh, set of results. Um, here, we want to look at um, who rallied 
uh, to back the war in Ukraine. That is, um, among the 92% of respondents who in December 2021 did not think it was a good idea to send armed troops into Ukraine, uh, what types of individuals then shifted to supporting the war when we did the survey in September of, of 2023, okay? Uh, so that's what we're interested in here. Um, who switched from being somebody who did not want to send troops in in December 2021, but in September 2023 said, yes, I support continuing uh, uh, the war. Um, uh, so uh, we can start off with some basic demographics and just to give you some sense of what these numbers mean, um, this tells us that women uh, were about 19 percentage points less likely uh, to change their position from not in favor of sending troops to favoring continuing the war. And this is similar to what uh, Rita found uh, in her work uh, uh, this morning. Um, we also see that agreeable respondents, um, this is uh, psychological uh, uh, research um, that's been pioneered by Graham Robertson and Sam Green, and they find that uh, people who have the personality trait of being an agreeable person, you know, people who don't like conflict and like to get along, um, uh, uh, they tend to really not like uh, 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 the war effort, um, which makes some uh, sense. However, some other factors that we might think are important don't really seem to be related, right? So, you know, your, your level of income, you, whether you uh, identify as Orthodox, whether you're Russian, town size here is not quite, um, uh, not quite statistically significant. And we see that the, the size of the changes here are, are all relatively small. Um, um, we also found that um, in uh, people who approved of Vladimir Putin in December of 2021, um, when Putin's approval rating was in the low 60%, right, um, that this group was very likely to shift in support uh, of the war effort. So this um, queuing effect that a politician can lead public opinion seems to be very prevalent um, in the Russian case. Um, we also see that these shy respondents, uh, these are the respondents that in December of 2021 said that they don't know or they didn't want to answer about what, what Russia should do in the situation in Ukraine. We find that they're about 13 percentage points less likely uh, to um, uh, support the war effort. So this tells us that there is some hiding going on uh, among respondents when you ask them uh, this question about what uh, Russia should do um, in its relations with uh, Ukraine. We also see that respondents who in December 2021 held strongly anti-Western views and had very strong traditional values. People who believe that marriage was between a man and should be between a man and a woman. Um, people who believe that Russia should not be empathetic towards the LGBTQ community. That this group too rallied to support um, uh, uh, the war effort. Um, we also looked at how people's media diets, again in 2021, predict their uh, support for the war in 2023. We don't find a lot going on here. We find that respondents who rely on the big three TV channels um, are no more likely than respondents who rely on Adnoklasniki or Vkontaktia, um, other Russian social media sites. Um, uh, 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 we find that they're not more likely to shift um, uh, towards backing the war. We do find that Facebook users, surprisingly, um, uh, were more likely to shift uh, in favor of supporting the war. We don't know why this is. It's not a large group. It's only about 12% of the population. And if anybody has an answer for that, I would be glad to, uh, I would be glad for your help. That's the one puzzling result. Um, also, um, respondents who believe that the Russian economy um, uh, is not doing well uh, were much less likely to shift and support the war effort. Um, and also people who thought that the um, uh, elites around Putin were mostly loyal uh, and were unified were a lot more likely to switch. Um, 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the conclusion. Uh, we also find, surprisingly, that having a close member of your family or your friends mobilized um, doesn't seem to have much impact on people's attitudes towards the war. And also having a close one who's in the military, who's fighting in the war, also doesn't have much uh, impact. And it could be because there are both positive and negative things going on there. On the one hand, um, uh, you're angry that you know, someone close to you has been mobilized. On the other hand, you, know, you want to support the war effort so that they're, they're safe and don't get hurt. So um, uh, there might be some interesting uh, relationships there that we're still trying uh, to sort out. So um, one way to tell the story about how people switched and came to support the war uh, in Russia is that it primarily came from people who had, were already supporting Vladimir Putin, who had strong traditional values, who held strongly anti-Western views, um, and uh, people who think that the, that the economy is doing well. So those seem to be you know, some of the main drivers for where we see support for the war uh, coming. Now, uh, I want to echo something that Rita said this morning, is these are just responses to survey questions. They're costless. The questions themselves are simple. You might say that they're simplistic. You know, but that's the nature of survey research. We're measuring attitudes and perceptions. We're not measuring actual behavior, right? Um, it's very important not to um, uh, project uh, uh, public opinion onto policy outcomes. Even in democracies, there are lots of policies that majorities overwhelmingly support that don't get passed uh, because there are small groups who care intensely about them uh, that, uh, 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 that ultimately win out in the policy process. So what are some other things that we can look at um, to try to measure public responses towards the war that are outside the context of a survey. Um, well, one thing we might look at shocks to the system, such as the uh, Ukraine's incursion uh, into Kurskaya Oblast and to the Prigozhin mutiny, and see how people respond, right? So uh, it didn't, others might have different views, it didn't seem to me that during Prigozhin's mutiny, there was a groundswell of support to take to the streets to defend the regime. Uh, you know, most people, most elites and the masses, you know, sat on the fences and waited to see how it was going to turn out before they, uh, before they made their decision. And this is very different from, say, uh, Erdogan's um, behavior during the mutiny in Turkey, where he went to the, the he went, got on the, the, the television, actually it was always on Facebook, wasn't it? And uh, uh, he said, go to the streets to defend the regime, because uh, he was confident that the masses would actually do that. Um, it could be the case that uh, you know, Vladimir Putin was less confident that if he asked people to go on to the streets that they would follow him, so uh, he did not uh, uh, do that. Um, so that's one way to look at public opinion outside of a, a, a survey context. Um, another is to look at the pay for contract soldiers, right? Uh, the more that the Russian government has to pay uh, to get people to fight is also a good kind of behavioral indicator of people's willingness to, uh, to, to go uh, and fight. And we see that uh, you know, the price for uh, getting someone to go fight in the war has been increasing. Um, we can also look at some kind of indirect measures. So while if we look at the Levada Center data, and I should say Levada conducted the survey, so I'm not uh, using this to criticize them. Uh, I love Levada Center. They've done a lot of great work. Um, but you know, it, it's the case that when you ask people how things are going in Russia, they say generally very good, right? Uh, uh, the direction of the country is positive rather than negative. But when you look at the behavior of Russians, it's not always the case. So like birth rates, for example, have been down sharply um, uh, since the start of the war, which suggests that there's a lot more anxiety and uncertainty uh, in people's actual behavior rather than uh, in their uh, survey responses. Okay. Uh, Last point, um, does this matter, right? Uh, Russia uh, is an autocracy, um, and uh, uh, 
you know, it's not as if uh, um, uh, Russian politicians are so accountable uh, that they fear that if they choose a policy that most Russians don't like, they will be uh, r removed from office. So one way to interpret these data is in line with the argument that I made in Weak Strongman, where um, Putin is seen as too strong to lose power, but too weak to govern effectively, and that he's constantly balancing uh, two potential challenges. One comes from the elite, and one comes from the masses. Uh, autocrats can be overthrown by an elite coup, or they can be overthrown by a, re re a revolt by the masses. And what makes this a challenging problem is that it's hard to resolve both of those at the same time. Typically, addressing one of those threats makes the other threat um, uh, more likely. So in this way, um, uh, public opinion does matter, um, and the Kremlin certainly th seems to think it matters because they are the largest uh, uh, purchaser of public opinion data uh, in Russia, and they pay very close attention um, to, to public opinion uh, uh, in Russia. Um, now, one might um, uh, argue that no, actually public opinion doesn't matter so much, um, because look at the high rates of casualties uh, in Russia, and it does not seem to have had much effect on Russian um, behavior. Um, but here, um, there's uh, an argument from uh, the U.S. case where um, there have been a lot, the U.S. has conducted lots of wars. There's lo lots of uh, research on public opinion towards uh, conflict, and one of the insights from this research suggests that, at least in the U.S. case, American public has been, was willing to tolerate casualties as long as they thought that the war was going in the right direction, right? But once uh, elites started to squabble and it became kind of legitimate to criticize the war, uh, uh, particularly the Vietnam case, um, uh, then uh, 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 people began to question uh, whether or not the war effort was worthwhile, and the impact of casualties had a big effect. So um, to date, most Russians think that they are winning. So it might be that Russians are saying, yes, the losses have been great, but as long as the, the perception is that the, uh, uh, the Russian military will ultimately be successful, they're willing to tolerate these kinds of losses. Um, now, I just came across this yesterday, so this is the last slide, and apologies for not translating this, but uh, um, uh, this suggests that, you know, maybe, you know, Russians' views on the state of the war, you know, m might be changing a little bit. Um, most surveys suggest that, you know, Russians think that the war is going well. This one points to evidence in a slightly different direction. And it says, you know, what do you think has the uh, conduct of the military operation in Ukraine brought more harm than good? And this is May 2023, 38% 30, said it brought more uh, good, 41% uh, said more harm, 21% said it's hard to say. In uh, September of 2024, only 28% said that it has brought m uh, more good, 47% said more harm, and about 25% said um, uh, that it was hard to answer. Um, so as we're looking forward, uh, one thing that we might be paying attention to is how Russians perceive uh, whether or not the war is going well. And that might go a long way to suggesting the direction in which r Russian public opinion is going to go. Thank you very much. Mm. Just take a seat. Great, thanks. Okay, we have around uh, actually about 12 minutes uh, before we have to break at half past one. We have a 10 minute, 10 minute break at that point. Um, I should have introduced myself before. My name is Matthew Blackburn. I'm a senior researcher at NUPI and I mainly work on Russian domestic politics. So it's been a pleasure to hear this presentation and I will just start off with a few kind of general questions. Um, if we think about um, how uh, the picture of Russia that was built up uh, in say the 10 years leading up to 2022, where Russia and the West are in sustained kind of confrontation, relations are worsening. Um, 
What would you say about looking at how that picture was understood? Which parts of it were translated to policymakers in the Biden administration? And we get to this critical period, there still seems to be a rather strong picture that this was a brittle regime and its yeah. support could easily change. So we, you talked earlier about how mm -hmm. the Kremlin reads polling data yeah. and it adjusts itself suitably. Um, but the West has also been doing that too. So maybe you might have some comments on why was, why was the West unable to make Putin unpopular, so yeah. to speak, yeah. in the last few years? So uh, uh, I think Russia is a big country uh, uh, and it's very difficult a uh, big complicated country, and it's difficult for uh, countries outside uh, to influence developments within Russia. In, in the Soviet period, uh, successive presidential administrations had great plans for how they could try to, to manipulate Russian you know, public opinion, to, to manipulate Russian elites, and had very little uh, impact. Actually, I think the biggest impact that the West has on Russian domestic politics is in its own behavior. Right. So uh, right now, uh, liberal democracy, um, uh, the brand of liberal democracy has taken quite a hit. Uh, and uh, events like January 6th in the United States um, have made it much more difficult for uh, people within Russia uh, to stand up and say, yeah, liberal democracy, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, I'm willing to sacrifice. Uh, that's a future that I would like. Um, so I think uh, rather than you know, trying to look at some kind of policy levers, if the West wants to have influence over Russian society, the best thing it can do is get its own house in order uh, so that Russians say, oh, this is an attractive model, I'd like. Because if you look at public opinion data, you know, Russians will say, oh, I'm very skeptical about democracy because I associate democracy with the 1990s. But um, electing my mayors, oh yes, of course I like that. Uh, uh, free speech, oh yes, uh, I like that as well. Freedom of assembly, uh, I like that. It's just democracy uh, uh, that I don't like because uh, they have this negative connotation with it. So. Um, when it came to the end of your book in 2021, uh, I think it was published before um, yeah. Navalny went back to Russia in 2021. Mm -hmm. You didn't have time to fit that into the picture fully. Yeah. Um, but looking back, if you look at how, where, you were, where you were in the middle of 2021, yeah. and if you had thought, based on public opinion, survey data, yeah. based on Putin's assessments of his strengths and weaknesses and his yeah. kind of relative stability, um, you wouldn't have been one to predict the invasion, of course, yeah. because predictions is a, is a loser's yeah. game. But um, overall, uh, how did you uh, kind of um, interpret the decision to launch the war? And then how do you interpret the nature of this war? Because it does relate to your presentation in a sense. Yeah, is, is, do you see it as a limited war that has been waged incrementally, so it's a salami slicing mm -hmm. approach? And does that, does that fit into your interpretation Good. of this data? Yeah, so in uh, uh, April of 2022, I was given the opportunity to uh, write a new epilogue for the paperback uh, a version of the book. And uh, this was only three weeks into the war, and the publisher said, oh, by the way, the book won't come out until September. Uh, so there was quite a challenge uh, to write something in March when we were still deep in the fog of war uh, uh, to say something that would have some weight. So uh, one thing I undersold in the book um, was that leaders are a lot more important on foreign policy, uh, both in democracies and particularly in autocracies. And to my mind, the invasion of Ukraine um, doesn't happen without Vladimir Putin. Uh, that th there are many people around him who are very skeptical of the West, but Putin is the one who really feels most strongly uh, uh, about Ukraine. Um, so my book doesn't account well, I think, for the actual decision uh, to go into Ukraine, which was really, I think, a personal decision made by uh, Vladimir Putin. What the book does better is at, it's, it's better at understanding why the performance of the Russian army wasn't what we expected it to be. Um, you know, all of the, the governance problems that I cite in the book and the difficult kinds of trade-offs uh, that Putin has to make, I think have really been borne out during the war. And mobilization is the perfect example where, you know, there's a lot of military reasons why Russia might like to mobilize its troops, but Putin recognizes that this would be a very costly endeavor, so he avoids doing it. So not so, the book isn't so good on the decision to go to war, but once we're at war, it does help to understand some of the dynamics. 
Before I open up to the floor for questions, yeah. I have one more. It's a little yeah. bit more of a geeky question, but not geeky, but it's about um, if you lose 5 or 6% of the population or 3%, the most yeah. influential voices, the ones yeah. with the biggest oh, influence, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they were in your data set, they were in the country, they were active before, yes. yeah, yeah, but yeah. then they're gone after February 2022 yeah. or after September 2022. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you factor that in? Because then yeah. you, have, you really are interested in that middle yes, so-called yes. apolitical segment. So, so two, two, two uh, broad points. One is the kinds of public opinion research that we do is very good for capturing the view of the average Russian, right? We don't have samples that are large enough to say anything about, for example, non-Russians. Like that, that would take a, a different sampling strategy. Or like uh, I mentioned Sam uh, Green and uh, uh, Graham Robertson, they're interested in the Russian middle class, right? So that's their group, online respondents, and they can say something interesting uh, about that. So um, what, what we can do is, on average, we can say, okay, there's a bias in the responses in that, you know, at the margins, there's going to be slightly less kind of pro-Western, pro-liberal uh, young people in our sample because they've already left the country. Um, often when we're interpreting public opinion data, uh, we know the direction of the bias, we just don't know how large it is. Uh, so we can say something about uh, 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 you know, the, in this case, that um, if th there were, this emigration had not happened, you know, support for the war would be slightly less, but we just don't know how much less. Excellent. Uh, I'll open to the floor uh, for any questions. Uh, please also state your name and affiliation. Yeah, question uh, on the left there. Mm. And then there as well. So I'll just take you in order. Uh, Uh, thank you. <coughs> oh, it's okay, Jakub. Okay. <coughs> My name is Jakub Godzimirski. I'm a research professor at NUPI, and I would like to ask you a question about, um, because uh, we have been discussing public attitudes, but those attitudes are influenced by many factors, and one of the factors is that uh, Russia is, uh, the Russian authorities are paying relatively well for uh, dying uh, yeah. on the battlefield. To what extent this can uh, explain some of the support for the war or lack of opposition towards the war and so on and so on? Yeah, great. Uh, so it's very interesting. On the one hand, the Russian government is saying that this is an existential crisis for Russia and that if we let our guard down, there'll be NATO tanks on Red Square tomorrow. Uh, on the other hand, it's not a war, it's a special military operation. It's not going to affect you. Don't worry about it. We're going to do everything we can to keep the economy going and insulate you from these effects. So this is uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons why there ha the support for the war has been relatively high is that the costs have been very concentrated on poor, uh, non-Russians, prisoners, uh, uh, groups that uh, lack even the marginal political voice that, you know, middle-class, urban, well-educated uh, Russians have. Uh, and I think, you know, for a long time that image can be um, perpetuated, uh, but as the casualties come back, I think the costs become harder and harder to hide. Um, so uh, it will be interesting to see how exposure to uh, casualties or war veterans. I know in the U.S. case in, in Vietnam, they had a huge impact. Um, uh, and in the Afghan war as well, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union, it had a big impact. Well, whether it'll have a big impact in Russia, I think, is yet to be seen. Adrian. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this talk. Adrian Rockstad from the University of Groningen. Uh, I have two questions. So one is, um, in one of your slides, uh, you showed a big change uh, in terms of anti-Western attitudes. So people with anti-Western yeah, yeah. attitudes were immediately above it, it said anti-NATO. Yeah, yeah. And that was nothing. Yeah. So that's, that's question one. What's, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. Question two is on the use of birth rates. And uh, yeah. as, yeah. So first of all, obviously, this is the question of whether not wanting to have children means that you support the war or whether you're just anxious about the future. But a separate question I've been wondering about is, is there not also just material reality going on here to be yeah. euphemistic? Yeah. I mean, tens of thousands of Russian men are either dead in exile or mobilized. Yeah. They're not going to have children. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so take the last question first. You know, the, um, 
Uh, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, this is a very much an indirect uh, uh, indicator, and it can be interpreted in a variety of ways. What I, I, I put that up there because I wanted to encourage people to start thinking about what are some of the other behavioral indicators we would see if Russians were confident in their future, uh, if they were not anxious. Uh, uh, so that's just one, uh, uh, one measure that gets us beyond the problem that surveys have of just being a kind of a costless, uh, costless response. Um, uh, the uh, other question, oh, about the, the anti, yeah. So we found that having anti-NATO attitudes in uh, uh, December 21 was not correlated with uh, uh, support for the war uh, later on. And it's not the case that anti-NATO and anti-Western attitudes were so highly correlated that one is knocking uh, the, other, the other out. It just is, I think, the anti-Western attitudes captures a very broad range of things, including culture, and that is really the the, 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 the message from the Kremlin that has gained more traction than a narrow anti-NATO message, which is a message that Russians have heard, you know, for, for a very long time. So the, the flip from being, you know, the West is our partner, we're integrating with Europe, to, oh no, the West is a separate civilization, and, uh, uh, you know, we're different, you know, that message seems to have resonated more. Okay, any more questions from the audience? At the front, yeah, yeah. Svetlana. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Svetlana Yerpolyova, Public Sociology Laboratory. Uh, so, uh, if those people who switched from not supporting uh, the uh, intervention to supporting the war yeah. are anti-Western, right, have traditional yeah. values, yeah. Uh, and anti-Putin, yeah. uh, do you have any insights on who are then those 8% who oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. initially would have supported the war. And I have some guess, Good. but I, I, I don't know. Good. Yeah. We, we can answer that question during the break when we look, if we can look at the data. And uh, I, I haven't explored it, um, but I will say that if you include that 8% back into the analysis, um, we see that respondents who supported uh, sending in troops in December 2021, 20, we're no more likely to support continuing the war than the average respondent. But people who thought that the Russia should send weapons in uh, became even more hawkish, and they supported continuing uh, the war. So among that group of more hawkish uh, respondents, uh, it was, you know, one group was more um, likely to shift their position uh, than another. The group that, um, uh, 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 the most interesting group there was the ones that said, uh, I don't want to answer this question, uh, and they're the ones that were significantly less likely to say that they uh, supported continuing the war. So we do, but we can answer the question of who were the super hawks in, uh, uh, in uh, February of, or no, December of 2021. Excellent. Any more One. questions from the audience at the back? Yes. Yeah, hello, Michael Gentile, University of Oslo. I have a somewhat technical question, and that is because the data that you've presented, fascinating, is about the 25-30% uh, of the um, persons that you contacted who probably responded. I don't know what the response rate is. Do you have a gut feeling about the, the other 75 or whatever it is percent? And then secondly, mm -hmm. because that's unit non-response, and then mm -hmm. concerning item non-response, if I remember yeah. correctly, you included that with the don't knows, right? Yeah. Right, so because I think that you can right. more or less confidently state that the refusals are equal to the yeah. wrong answer uh, well, you just yes. sort of say the, the socially undesirable answer, whereas the don't knows could be just about anything. Yes. Yeah, no, no, you're exactly right. The last bit we full, you, you, the, your interpretation of the don't knows is, 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 is exactly what we did here, which is we folded them in with the, uh, in, in the continuing the war case, we folded them in with people who said that they don't support continuing the war. So I, sh I should have made that clear. Um, we have a whole paper that looks at all of the technical uh, uh, questions about 
item non-response and about response rates. And one of the things that's nice we can do with the panel survey is we can look at the attrition rates. So not everybody continues to participate over time. And, and we see that the, depending on the wave, the re-interview, successful re-interview rate is around 70%, which is very similar to other kinds of panel surveys. And the same things that predict uh, people not taking part in future waves in a survey in non-war settings in democracies also predict uh, uh, attrition in our sample as well. So for example, men, uh, unreliable men are more likely to drop out than reliable women. We find the same thing uh, in our data. One of the most interesting things in the analysis of who drops out of the different waves is that um, Putin opponents are more likely to stay in the sample, right? So one way to interpret that is this is some opportunity for them to voice their views. Uh, it's, you know, it's not a huge group, but uh, 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 that was one of the more anomalous results. But the other, on the other indicators, our panel behaves a lot like other panels. I'm glad though, there's some other, you know, people who are really interested in the technical, uh, you know, geeky questions about uh, that we spend so much time thinking about. Well, we will have we, we have time for just one more quick question, and then we have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. Kirill, you have the last question. Thank you, Kirill Shamifi CFR. I have a question about: Have you traced any spillover effects of those who were initially opposing the invasion, then became supportive of the war, to say abortion, immigrants, any other? Ooh, no, that's, good. that's, that's a very good question. And actually, you know, we have this new wave of the the survey that's going in the field in October, and that will give us some opportunity to see if there is change at the individual level. So it could be that somebody switches in September 2023 and says, oh no, the war's not going so great, I oppose it. And then we interview them in October 2024 and they say, oh no, actually, we're not, we're not doing so badly, so maybe I do support it. So that's one of the things that, that we'll be tracking with this next wave uh, that we can't do uh, with this, but that's a great suggestion. All right, in that case, I will wrap things up and please um, share your thanks and appreciation for Tim Fry for coming all the way from America and give us this okay, talk. Thank you.